Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Brett Thompson of Zanzi Meats on this episode. We chat with Brett about his history in the plant-based food space and getting started as a cultivated meat startup in South Africa. We hear about the exciting journey of getting your first angel check and really kickstarting your company and looking into moving into a new space. I learned a lot on this episode and Brett is a wealth of knowledge. Let's jump right in. Thanks for joining us on the Future Food Show. I'm super excited to have Brett Thompson of Mizanzi Meats here. Brett, welcome to the show. Alex, thanks very much for having me. Tell us about your background and your journey to really creating Mizanzi Meats. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have always been involved in food since my career started. I graduated with economics as my course uh, or chosen course, and, and I wrote my thesis on the economic case for vegetarianism. And that led me to getting a job at South Africa's largest uh, meat alternative producer. And um, it's about 10 years ago now. So I've been working in more of the sort of sales and marketing side of food and alternative protein. But throughout that time, I was doing a lot of work in animal advocacy, um, meat free Mondays, as we call it here, meatless Mondays, as you would know it, and uh, working on sort of nationwide campaigns to encourage people to eat more plant-based um, and uh, less uh, meat or conventional meat products. So that kind of was the where I started, sort of where I cut my teeth and um, in retail, trying to understand a consumer, particularly a South African consumer who was is very, very close to meat. And I really wanted to understand them. And, and that got me working in a lot more food awareness type organizations, ultimately brought me to Berlin. And um, that's where I got first-hand experience with cultivated meat. And maybe I'll pause there, but um, that's sort of the, the starting point of this journey. That's fascinating. And, you know, before we do go into the, the you know, Berlin, I'd love to ask you, you know, what, what is that largest producer of alternative protein in South Africa? Uh, that company is called Fry's Family Foods. Uh, they, some of your listeners might know Live Kindly, and they're part of the Live Kindly Now banner. And they produce a wide range of products from burger, sausages, schnitzels, uh, just all, all the sort of products that you're used to, uh, but from a plant-based space. Um, and, and manufactured from here, here based in, or manufactured based in South Africa. Wow. Okay. So I'm a huge fan of fries, um, especially their plant-based like fish. I don't know. Their, their stuff is really good. So you mentioned they're part of Live Kindly. They were not always part of Live Kindly. Is that correct? That's a good point. I, I mean, look, yeah. The, so just also, it's quite interesting, the context there. I mean, when I started at Fry's 2011, there was... Tammy Fry, who was my boss, um, you know, there's a manufacturing team and and, and, and an admin team, but the, Tammy Fry, she was the only person in the marketing department, and then I joined. Um, so I was very lucky to kind of get an experience over the already 10 years from 2011 onwards um, to experience the growth firsthand of plant-based. And the team now is international. I think it's been like 50, 60 people all over the world. And that's because roughly about two or three years ago, they were bought out, I think is the correct way of describing it, by Live Kindly, backed by Blue Horizon. And the more interesting thing that was that they did a joint venture to create Live Kindly Africa with South Africa's largest food company, which also ha so happens to be Rainbow, or RCL or Rainbow Chickens. So they were actually one of South Africa's largest chicken and meat producers. So I think a fantastic showcase of the direction that the market is moving here here in South Africa. That's interesting. And, you know, I think we can uh, dive deep on all those kinds of topics and, and different brands and, and companies, but that might be for a different show. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, are you plant-based and how long, if so? Yeah, I, I, I describe myself, well, my diet is mostly plant-based. Um, I stopped eating meat 15 years ago after listening to or doing a applied ethics course at university that kind of changed literally changed my life because that led me to writing the thesis and then you know i think around about 2013 i stopped uh, i moved in with a guy who's vegan and and he just made pretty decent food and so it made it very easy for me just to eat pretty much a vegan diet and i've sort of been like like that way ever since so you're in south africa you're working for fries and then you make this transition to berlin so why did you go to Berlin and what did you do once you got there? Yeah, I was uh, living in a, in a city uh, 
called Durban, which is on the east coast, where where Fry's is headquartered uh, or was headquartered at the time. And um, I had been doing a lot of work, sort of the side. Or Fry's are obviously very much encouraging it when it comes to animal advocacy. Um, they, you know, the family uh, Wally and Debbie Fry, uh, vegetarians for their whole life, or, or Debbie a vegetarian for most of her life, and, and Wally um, uh, went that way as well. So the family is very much in favour of working in animal advocacy type work. So I was running um, the Meat Free Mondays campaign and through that connected with Melanie Joy from Beyond Carnism and, and Tobias Leonard from the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. And I, they, they came out to South Africa, we spent time together and then after a while they said, well, what, would you consider moving or applying for a job in Berlin? And so I did. I, I, I took the plunge, I applied for the job, I got the job and um, decided to as much as I loved working at Fry's, I thought I really wanted to go and find out what's happening internationally and, and, and I have a new experience. Um, so made the plunge, moved to, to Berlin almost two months after I applied for the job. Had no idea what to, what I was doing, didn't understand the language. And uh, started working for Beyond Carnism and then also working for ProVeg International, which might be familiar. And so I, I took quite a shift away from working in sort of the for-profit side of things and, and went straight into the not not for profit, but I think the the way that I like Provage's approach is that they look at making plant based more accessible by providing more alternatives, more options, uh, more availability at your local supermarket. And so I was working as the global coordinator eventually um, for Provage International and connected with a number of people and, and and a number of them being scientists and entrepreneurs working in very exciting you know, this sort of two point oh of plant based. And cultivated meats. I'd come from the traditional um, fries started in 1991. So I'm from the plant-based space that is kind of the the OG, let's say. Um, and then after spending a couple of years in Berlin, I, I was just like, there's such an exciting new school of thinking that's adding to this, creating new solves for a massive challenge. And then I just wanted to get involved with that. And, and that's the driving force that got me towards cultivated meats and, 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 and doing it on my own. So we see a lot of exciting companies come out of, not only come out of Berlin, but specifically out of ProVeg and not actually just from their incubator, but also from some of the folks that have worked at ProVeg, you know, maybe, maybe we're not part of the incubator. And so when was your kind of light bulb moment when you thought, okay, it's time to start a company? I mean, one of those folks he, he, who was working for the incubator, not directly in it was, um, Jacek, uh, his, his company was called Kuliana, and I think it's not called Current, it's plant-based seafood. I remember having just a number, number of conversations with him over table tennis and others about them all looking at starting their own companies. And, 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 and I just started getting super excited about entrepreneurship and its potential. And, you know, I actually had went through a bit of a, a patch and I was just feeling a bit burnt out and working for a company or working for an organization as, as fun as it was and as good as it was at Provage. I really just felt I needed to take some time off and was one part. And then the other part is I wanted to do something on my own. And I kind of remember the, you said the light bulb moment. I almost remember it exactly. I was in a coffee shop in Wedding, which is a suburb of Berlin that I lived in, sitting there and just thinking what I'm going to do. And I was like, well, like, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to take some time off and then I'm going to just go on my own. And I ended up doing that. I spent a couple of months in well, Europe and then I went into Australia and everything. And I and I had then also connected with a few folks from the Bay Area working in cultivated meat and came back to South Africa uh, roughly 2018, 2019 and didn't start directly uh, into a cultivated meat company, but I started a nonprofit called the Credence Institute. Credence is an animal advocacy organization working uh, essentially as a think tank. And um, the initial research that we did was there's two sort of major things that we got involved with. One was with called Animal Advocacy Africa, which is a program that's running to this day, um, which is looking to bring additional funding into Africa because it's just a massive bottleneck with organizations being able to get funding. Um, and that's what their project that they're working on. And then the other thing is that we just did a bunch of research on consumer understanding, because that's my kind of background of, of cultivated meat in South Africa and with the, with a view for the rest of the continent. And connected up with some folks and just realized that, well, there's no one on the continent at this stage, 2019, who had started doing cultivated meat. And, you know, that was, I felt the, the opportunity that that in, internal entrepreneur flame was looking for and decided to jump 
everything into it and 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 start in Zanzi technically at the end of 2019 but officially at the at March 2020 which you will recall was when the whole world decided to stop working which was a great time to start a company yeah maybe may the perfect time to start a company <laughs> so wow okay so you go back to South Africa you know start the nonprofit and then make this transition maybe just tell the audience what Mizanzi is and, and what you guys do yeah, sure. It's, um, in terms of that time of starting a company quickly, um, March 2020, when we were all stuck at home, I just call it pitches and PJs because you were just sitting around at home sending off pitch deck after pitch deck, trying to get people excited about your company. So a very interesting time. But I think, as you said, it was actually quite a good time to start a company. Food was on the table. It was a discussion. Stenotic diseases, were, which were not known to most people, were now being spoken about. And we got some kind of initial interest because we were looking and talking about food and food systems and, and what it meant for global health. In terms of Mzanzi, uh, the simple way to describe it is we are Africa's first cultivated meat company, started in 2020, as I mentioned. And what we are doing is cultivating cells from cows in a way that we obviously do not require those animals to be slaughtered. And we are making beef burgers. That's our first, uh, has been our first product that we made. And we were the first ones on the continent to bring beef burgers and get people to eat them. That's a key component, getting people to eat our meat. And we did that in April of uh, 2022. And we are aiming to be the first ones to be bringing our beef burgers to a nationwide uh, restaurant chain um, in the first quarter of next year, probably on a limited scale, but an exciting scale nonetheless. I want to ask about consumer perception in South Africa. Is it pretty consistent with what we've seen on the research in the UK, maybe in the US, or is South Africa and the perception to you know, cultured meat, cultivated meat a little bit different? Let me just step back. And uh, when, when, when we started that research in 2019, under my previous organization that was, uh, I was running, there was no information available. There was limited research. The only research that was in any type of emerging market was coming out of India and China. But there was nothing available for the South African and African palate and, and, and pref uh, preference. So I thought, you know, that was like an, a key moment for me to try and understand um, what is the landscape at the moment. So we did research on plant-based and cultivated meat at that stage to try and find out what the consumer adoption rate would be, the, the perception and, and the understanding. And it was actually based on a study that was, had been done in China, I think in the UK, it might be the one that you're referencing. It's a consumer perception study that's been done in a few countries, including the US, and we just wanted to replicate that, localize it, English and Zulu, and make it available to as many South Africans from a representative sample size, which was key in South Africa. Just a quick note, we've got 11 official languages, very different people from different races, different religions, etc. So it was kind of key to get that right in terms of the data. The interesting thing was that well, it was very limited, the understanding of cultivated meat. Awareness was very, very low, which... In, on initial, you're like, okay, this is not good. And, and this is compared to other emerging markets and, and, and other studies that have been done abroad. And once that process had been done, and we asked the similar questions again, we, are, we were trying to find out what the likelihood of that purchase would be once it became widely available. And plant-based meat, which has been around in South Africa for 30 years, it's about 57% of South African consumers said that at a point where it was widely available, that they would choose it. And, and then when it came to cultivated meat, it wasn't that far off. It was about 53% of South African consumers said that when cultivated meat became widely available, they would purchase it. And I think the other interesting points to add is that, and I'm sure a number of your listeners will note that South Africa has got quite a different, our past has meant that there's a lot of people that live within poverty and, 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 and even and our, obviously our current system doesn't help. We, we were trying to find out whether or not there will be some sort of breakdown on, on, on economic and, and racial lines. And the Interesting research that we got out of was that a early adopter of cultivated meat was Zulu speaking, was living in an urban area that was probably just just lower middle lower middle class, maybe a little bit higher. But interesting, were driven from an environmental reason to make a purchase, such as cultivated or plant based meat, and also were willing to spend slightly higher um, for meat or protein that they viewed would probably be more it would be better for them opposed to maybe the conventional meats that they're eating already. So quite interesting research, quite a, an opportunity, I think, for, for um, plant-based and cultivated meat companies. And, and I think 
what I've seen now being on the other side as sort of a company in Zanzi is that we were able to make sure that the narrative within media was positive, not media in terms of um, where we grow ourselves, but in terms of the, the media from, from journalists that we were engaging with. And when we did this launch, we reached millions of people. South Africa has got a group the size of about 60 million population. Our PR reached about 42, 50 million in circulation of people. And it was overwhelmingly positive. And you weren't seeing things such as Frankenstein burgers or uh, lab sausages as much. It was really positive. And I think it was because we, the heavy lifting had been done by the other cultivated meat companies so that in South Africa, we could just approach and showcase, look, it's a very, already a product. It's already a product, but um, now we're just doing it in a different way here in South Africa. And it was, it was predominantly positive, the response. So, yeah. That's a lot of great and very specific detail. Is that information that you collected through Credence Institute? Correct. So that was a, that was a, a Credence Institute did that research 2019, 2020. It's available online. It's on Open Science and then also on Frontiers. I can provide you so that your listeners can, can check it out. And the, we did it with Effective Altruism Community, the Center for Effective Altruism, and, um, and together with a consulting group out in the States. So we, we really got an inter- ability to showcase local understanding from working with uh, an international organization that gave us that perspective. Great. And yeah, we can put those links into the show notes. After Mazanzi Meets is created, you mentioned that you were kind of sharing pitch decks. Was this to raise a pre-seed or some initial funding? Yeah. Look, in the beginning, it was very difficult, uh, but still very difficult. Starting a company is, 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 is definitely the most challenging thing that I've, I've been, ever tried to do. In the beginning, we're trying to convince South African investors about cultivated meat, get them to understand cultivated meat, having no precedent to show from the continent. And then we were trying to show international investors that South Africa was a place that you wanted to put your dollar or your euro or whatever in in an industry that was um, brand new overseas and had never been done locally. And I think the other thing is cultivated meat that hasn't really showcased besides in, in Singapore, a proof of concept all the way to a consumer consuming your product. And that was incredibly difficult. So we were sitting there by that stage. I think there was three of us on the team. We would, we were just on an idea. We, we were like, here's our plans. We didn't even have a lab because we couldn't go into a lab. And that initial phase was just about getting an angel check to start the process. And um, what happened is uh, after working with the folks from GFI and the network that we had created of the founders' sort of start careers, we got in touch with Ryan Bethencourt. And I think his name is probably not probably pretty familiar to, to you. And, and he gave us our first check. And um, the rest is not history, but it, it is what got us going, got us scientists, got us into a lab and, and then attracted more angel investment. And then that led to a pre-seed and, and the ability to get a proof of concept that at a, at a pretty speedy rate, at a pretty low cost that has resulted into where we are today. Wow, that's amazing. And it's really cool to see Ryan and now also Marilise supporting so many different companies in the space. So that's super exciting. I think, you know, Marilise, uh, obviously she played an incredible role sort of as we've started to grow as a company, but then Sustainable Food Ventures, they came on in the pre-seed and that really helped us solidify things and get folks from the Glassville syndicates and get folks from other parts of the world and, and, and also then into a, an accelerator from one of our, uh, one of our big supporters, Canal. Um, so yeah, so it's been, it's been great. Great. And what accelerator did you guys join? So we joined Brink based out of Hong Kong. I think they've also got other places that they work from, but yeah, we're working from there. Very cool. You know, one thing that the listeners will probably comment if I don't ask <laughs> is there's always a, this, this special sauce, right? And from a technology standpoint, is there anything that you would say set Mizanzi apart from other companies other than the unique aspect of being in South Africa? Yeah, I think there's the question about what makes Mzanzi magic and, and unique. And I think there's a lot of factors that combine. I think what is setting us apart is, and, and has enabled us to get to prototype in such a quick and, and cost-effective manner is the, has firstly been the relative speed at which we achieved an immortal cell line. And that cell line is uh, our beef cell line, especially that it's non-genetically modified and 
which is important for us in terms of a European potential market down the line. But the the, the, the curious thing that we, we found out was that it was sort of clumping together without the need for scaffolding in our initial prototype runs. So that's just enabled us to have a cell line that is just that much faster um, than what we've seen elsewhere. And, and again, with complications on scaffolding and also just maybe um, taste profile, the, the, the lack of scaffolding that w- was required for our first prototypes meant that we, we got from we got into the lab in November 2020 and we got a prototype less than 18 months later. That speed and the cost-effective nature that we did it is what sets us apart. About 25 to 50% when it comes to buy racks and manufacturing, cheaper to do it here in South Africa when compared to the rest of the world. And so when you were able to do something a little bit quicker like we are with some of the tech that we've developed, and then also at a price point that is just that much cheaper, that those two big hurdles on CapEx and OpEx are uh, a little bit smaller now than they were more definitely for us 18 months ago, but I think in terms of the industry as a whole. Does the South African government support technologies like this in any way? Look, so in the beginning, we were partially funded by the government. We work out of a shared working space here in Cape Town, where, where our, our head, head office is based. And we were we got a lump sum and and also some assistance with consumables and with rent and a whole bunch of stuff, which was partly from for profit but also from non profit sources being directly from the government. So they definitely maybe not so directly. I don't think they they were just supporting a small enterprise, but we were definitely supported by the government in the beginning. I think there's a lot of different factors to say what it's going to mean going forward. The regulations that we are going to have to contend with and whether or not our government is seeing this as something that they want to encourage. I think we probably don't have the same sort of sophisticated lobby groups that you, you would have in Europe and in, and in America, but we do have them. There's been some recent developments from the Department of Agriculture that are not in favor of alternative proteins, particularly plant-based. But I think what we're trying to showcase to government and to everybody is that we're a meat company. We actually fit currently under our interpretation of the what defines meat in South Africa and what defines food that can be sold. And we believe, obviously, and this is the discussion that we're trying to have and what you need to have in South Africa is that the work that we're going to be doing is pro poor because we can get more people eating healthy protein and it's going to create more jobs. In South Africa, if you, if you aren't creating something that is perceived to create more jobs in the future, it's a very big uphill to get support from government. Cool. And, and I think I saw photos of the space that you guys are in on your website, I think it's called BioCity. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It looked super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been look, BioCity, and we're in the process of moving. So I'll send you a couple of pictures of our space. BioCity is a nonprofit and for-profit joint venture, and it has the backings of Merck and Thermo Fisher on the one side, but also the local small business unit here in, in South Africa, as well as the financing for small businesses. So it was a combination that has enabled us to plug into a lab that it was plug and play. Essentially gave us the keys and said, you guys can use the space. And it meant that CapEx in the beginning was, it was just a fraction. Even the rental was a fraction of what we would pay if we went to a private lab in South Africa. And also the level of bureaucracy that you can imagine what comes from public or uh, university labs, it wasn't there. So we plugged in straight away. We were able to, to get up and running quickly and, um, and put scientists to work. So it's definitely enabled us to get to where we are and part of the reason why we've been able to do it in such a cost-effective way. So what's next for Mazanzi? You guys have expanded your team, have raised the initial funds and, and maybe more after that, uh, have some pretty big backers, have been in Brink Accelerator, moving into a new space. This is super exciting. What's next? Yeah, it's, I mean, we're currently in a fundraise during our seed round. And the goal of that raise is to put together a pilot production facility that, again, will be another first for Africa and help put us on the map in a larger way. The goal there is to be able to prove concept with our first customer. They're called Rocker Mamas. It's a burger, nationwide burger chain here in South Africa who are very interested in what we're doing. And we are trying to work with them to show that at a pilot scale, we can service some restaurants and work with regulators to showcase that, that that's done. So, you know, if I'm looking at the next 18 months, those are the key components that we need to do. Once we've kicked off that pilot and, and we're on the way with the raise, the team 
we need to grow. We've got to bring team, I think, international folks to bolster the ranks, to get some folks from experience locally and grow the team considerably so that we can put optimization on the top of the list. I think there's efficiencies that everybody needs to achieve in terms of what the media can do, the product media can do. And that's when the unit economics start making more sense. Um, so our second or third goal, well, first is raise the seed, build a pilot production facility, get into more restaurants, and then optimize the whole process before going and saying, how do we get this into retail? Because that's our ultimate goal. And underlying that whole process is, is we want to start looking at different indigenous meat that is only found in South Africa so that we can really differentiate ourselves there again, differentiate and then proliferate ourselves from the rest of the world. And for us, it's about trying to do that and then approaching the international market with the South African meats that we uh, then start um, making here in Cape Town. Exciting. And are you guys currently hiring? I never say no to anything, but we're definitely looking for folks in the R&D space. We're probably looking to make hires in the next three to six months food technologists, bioprocessing, anyone interested in, um, in food is always also, the door is always open, but definitely food technologists and bioprocessing is where we're looking at in the next three, six months. Brett, do you have any last insights for our listeners today? We're at a pretty interesting time. Cultivated meat is proved concept. It's gone from the side plate to the main plate, or should I say? I think I'm curious and interested to see what can be done by the larger companies that are really going from that uh, pilot production into large retail potential uh, producing meat companies. So your good meats adjust and, and upside. And I think it's a very exciting space to be in. But there's also this notion that I think we spend a bit too much money as an industry. But we've got to try and work out how to get the economics right. I think that's where we're kicking in as much as we can. Because of the position that we are in, in terms of the geography, and, and our exchange rate, we have to make sure the economics works from day one. And um, I'm hoping that I'll start seeing that as well from companies across the globe. You can learn more about Mizanzi Meat Co. at mizanzimeat.co. That's M-Z-A-N-S-I meat.co. And learn more about Brett on LinkedIn. But Brett, I want to ask you actually, you know, we talked about it a little bit before, but not on the show. What does Mizanzi mean? It's a very known word here in South Africa, but I realize that not many people overseas do know it, or even outside of Southern Africa. Mzanzi quite literally means south, south as the direction, but Mzanzi is a nickname or a colloquial term for South Africa. So we wanted to choose something that could be understood by all 11 official languages in South Africa. And Mzanzi was the way that we could really sort of capture a lot of the culture that we find in South Africa. I love it. Well, Brett, thank you so much for being on the show. Alex, thanks so much for having me. Cheers. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. This program was produced by H Media. See you soon.